Ah, well, thank you, Lorena, very, very well, thank you. And I also uh, want to bring attention, I, I brought my partner and the real source of inspiration, uh, Ati uh, Blackwell, who is my partner in the firm and in life, and uh, she's here, and none of this happens without our collaboration and working together. Uh, but she wants me to do all the talking first, mostly, so here I am. So, uh, you know, this is a different uh, talk for me. Uh, Nadir threw me a curveball uh, when he said, I don't want you to just come and talk about your work, I want you to talk about your pedagogy, your teaching. And part of this comes from uh, a lecture I gave at MIT uh, 10 years back, I don't know if Nadir remembers this, but we were in his studio and he came over to me in his very grave kind of uh, uh, expression as he, if you know Nadir, he can have sometimes. It's like, uh, Marlon, you have a crisis. Uh, you have a crisis between what you practice and what you teach. And he says, they're both very good. He said, they just don't seem to uh, be informed by each other. And I hope I got that right. But I, I was like, oh, well, I, that's, that's by, by design. I, I, I used to teach with Peter Eisenman uh, years ago. And we would always talk about, yeah, what we're doing in the studio has nothing to do with what our, we really do to make practice. And, and, and also the desire not to have emulation. Like, you know, you go in and teach and everybody does what you do. It's really about opening up new frontiers for the students and uh, really uh, asking questions like, what if, uh, uh, you know, why not, uh, imagine, and that sort of thing. But because I, I took Nadir seriously about this talk, I dug into that and have tried to find relationships. And I've actually found more relationships than I ever would have imagined, and then probably there's more than he might have imagined, between what we do, what we practice, uh, uh, in effect, uh, production uh, and, and technology versus, you know, theory, what we teach. Uh, so we've, I've sort of boiled it down to uh, really a, a combination or two strategies, systems and shapes that really informs the work that we're doing in the office, as well as the work that I'm often engaged in in, in the studio, in the, in the design studio. Uh, and as Lorena said, I'm, we have a, a, a small practice of about 18 people in Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is in the middle of the Ozarks. It's, uh, we like to call it the land of Bill and a billion chickens. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the foothills uh, of the Ozark. It's also home of Walmart, the capital of Walmart. Uh, and it's undergoing a real transformation right now, uh, both culturally and economically. It's, uh, it's, you, if you look in the five best places to live in the country, it's always in the top five. It has a, a kind of really, flies under ra radar, a really unique quality of life. And we uh, often, we're very much into repurposing. So, you know, we bought a building, we fixed it up, something we did for about $69 a square foot, I think. So a building, we couldn't figure out what to do. We stepped, keep, you know, ripping the uh, rock off. And the problem was it started tearing the structure out. So we just, our big strategy here was to paint it in thin stripes, and then take every window opening and do an essay on windows, everything from Marshall Brewer to Sigurd Liberit. So we're always interested in how buildings can be somewhat didactic. Now, as uh, uh, a young uh, person in high school growing up, I was a wrestler, uh, and uh, I had an experience of having to wrestle a wrestling bear, a live bear, for practice. This was in Colorado one time. It was a very kind of uh, memorable moment in my evolution and formation. Uh, it's nothing like getting your butt whipped by a 500 pound wrestling bear that actually knows wrestling moves. So anyways, when you come into our office, uh, this is the existential question about facing the bear and the challenges. And of course, I always like to say payback's a bitch. So, you know, here we go. So uh, office, the studio environment is what we like to keep kind of a more striated rather than uh, a, a kind of tiered uh, as a such. And, you know, it's a very uh, kind of open uh, studio, uh, lots of empowerment, I think, with uh, everyone ha playing a role in the manifestations, the conceptualization and the manifestation uh, of our projects. And so I am caught between these two worlds of the academy and practice. And I use the academy to really inform the practice and solve problems in practice as much as I use practice to solve uh, problems and challenges uh, in the academy. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we uh, engage and get students uh, again to uh, immerse themselves uh, in the world as it's given to them. 
Now, I live in a land of really disparate, uh, disparate conditions. Uh, words like abandonment, nostalgia, erasure, uh, uh, they're all uh, exploitation, they're all aspects of this place. Uh, but there are some really, uh, some great gems here. It's uh, often uh, thought of as a place, uh, Arkansas, as a place of real natural beauty, but simultaneously one of real constructed ugliness. But there are lots of exceptions, and this is one of them. The building you see on the left, uh, Faye Jones, uh, very uh, a classic, uh, really part of the canon now, uh, Thorn Crown Chapel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, about an hour away. And we've taken everybody to this chapel, uh, Zoom Thor, Herzog, Eisman, Murcutt, you name it, we've taken them there. And they all have a very similar visceral reaction to the building because it is architecture in many ways at the highest level. Now just across town is another icon in the landscape. Uh, it's part of a, a, a tourist uh, destination called the Passion Play where actors act out the uh, life of Christ at the base of this icon. And he's affectionately known in this part of Arkansas as Milk Carton Jesus. And he was designed to be really super tall, to be seen for miles. And as they were erecting him, uh, uh, they discovered that the FAA was going to require that he have a flashing blue light on top of his head. So rather than redesign him, what they did is just cut him off at the knees and push him back into the ground. And, and now he has these uh, proportions, uh, more like a milk carton. In any event, I show this to you to illustrate the highs and the lows of what we're working between. And we don't see our task as one of resolving one condition to the other, but in fact, as creating resonance between these conditions and taking an inclusive approach uh, to begin to wrap our arms around the world as it's given to us so that we can represent it on our terms as we find it. And to do that, we have to be, I think, much more inclusive in our thinking. And so, as Lorena says, we love to think uh, uh, of architecture as larger than the subject of architecture. So what we like to do is put on a, our wide-angle microscopic lens uh, to generate ideas and actions from the everyday world by being very close observers of our place around us and we're always looking for the patterns that connect, uh, the relationships between what is nature made and what is culture made, and finding sources of inspiration between those conditions. And also looking between the ideal and the real, between the ideal in our discipline and the improvised. And again, taking an inclusive approach, they all have value, not to uh, create the kind of plus minus black white uh, uh, kind of oppositions that we're often uh, challenge to do in, in, the, in, in the discipline. And by looking just at the everyday world, by looking at things, uh, I think uh, Leonardo da Vinci said it best, uh, you know, it should not be so hard for you to look into the ashes of a fire or mud or light places, clouds, in which you may find really marvelous ideas. So all we're trying to do out of the muck of our own condition out of the, uh, the, the, the chaos sometimes of the design studio is to find really marvelous ideas. And working through uh, the reductive uh, operations of abstraction to be kind to represent the familiar world in a more strangely and unfamiliar way, or strangely familiar way. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in because I've got a lot to show you because I'm combining, again, teaching and practice so there's more stuff to help you see these connections, but systems for us is something that, first of all, all the studios that I uh, deal with are really based in transformation or transmutation, about observing, looking, translating the world, but never taking it so far that you leave where you're, the origins of where you began behind, but it's always embedded. And so the DNA of where you begin is in the DNA of where you end. And it's more of a transmutation rather than a transformation. Uh, and systems for us are really deals more with indeterminacy, uh, deals more with the seriality that we find uh, in nature, we find in uh, culture, uh, and we find in systems of articulation as we try to generate those in the work. So uh, I'll just show you a little bit from a study we did at the University of Michigan that in many ways started with just looking at elements 
the things that are most often overlooked in architecture, columns, doors, windows, uh, a kind of a less of a, a formal approach about the, uh, you know, the building. In fact, uh, what we have tried to do uh, in all the studios is take not a comprehensive approach that sees technology as its source, but more of an interscalar uh, approach with interscalar relationships being the source of a more integrated approach. And I think that has proven to be much better when you consider the scale of the city, the scale of the building, and the scale of the hand, the detail, as op opportunities for resoluteness uh, in uh, the making of architecture in the fullest sense of the word, and as a key to get beyond the merely diagrammatic, which is often uh, in the built environment what we are left with. And so we just looked at columns. You know, what is a column? How do you, what does it do? How do you define columns? What types of columns are out there? And so students studied this just initially for a few weeks, trying to define it uh, on, as an archetype uh, on, on, on their terms and to understand what it does, not just what it looks like, but what does it do? Uh, and then we challenged the students to take, in this particular case, a student was given a column, but he was told also, you will now take a window and you will hybridize these two into a singular figure. And this will be a, a kind of uh, your base figure for a field condition that you will develop uh, that will create, uh, hopefully, uh, the basis for an architecture. So he begins to uh, define a column, columns from where it's found in nature, where it's found in culture, uh, and begin to see the patterns that connect there. And then begins to develop his own uh, prototype, uh, uh, combining an idea about the column and the window, but now treating the element as a spatial proposition. So not something that you perceptually inhabit, uh, but actually becomes you're able to inhabit. And so it becomes something that is part of the spatial character of an interior uh, condition. And so going through a variety of studies and iteration, which is absolutely man uh, you know, uh, very important, uh, and looking at variety, variation, uh, and not the self-sameness that you get in a mechanical iteration, but things that are self-similar uh, when you're doing it uh, in, a, in a more thoughtful and reflective way. And so he went through a whole series of these and began to develop his, his base figure, which then he begins to organize. Uh, in this case, we're doing a project, a library, with 100 reading rooms in Marfa, Texas, a library for the Western Canon in Marfa, Texas. And so he inserts uh, these uh, figures into the sheds that are like a Donald Judd sheds almost, uh, and creates uh, a dichotomy uh, between uh, a parametric condition and the more Cartesian dimension. And where they morph together, uh, great things happen uh, in this interior uh, uh, Place. And so there's the basic box, so light, so the idea of the column window, uh, again, as a singular figure begins to provide light, articulation, space, the reading rooms, and you begin to see this as a kind of a jellyfish that has its own interiority within the Cartesian boxes or sheds uh, in, in this particular plaza. And, and one of the things we're always trying to do is introduce new techniques to students, creating a workflow between analog and digital. Uh, seeing, uh, allowing every student to find what works best for them, but never allowing them just to become consumed by one technique. And so every year we take a position about space, light, material, but also about uh, uh, representation. In this case, it's a poppy red prisma color in which all the spaces are made. And so he's working back and forth and developing this between the hand and the digital. Uh, to develop uh, these particular spaces. And in our own work, it was it running parallel to a project we were doing in the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Art and Nature Park, an experiential center that we're working with uh, Mary Miss, an environmental artist there, and Ed Blake, landscape architect, where we were developing a kind of modern grotto, an extended threshold into the park uh, that is somewhat cave-like, and we were really taken by columns, and what could a column do more than just support something. Now we're working directly with Guy Nordenson on this, who informed us after going through all these iterations of developing columns that they didn't need to be structural in the end. What they needed to be were vessels of light. So I, I kind of wanted my money back uh, for this, uh, as a structural engineer, but actually not really. He became a really great collaborator 
in a screw. So we went through all of these, fascinated by these columns that uh, uh, Alvar Alto had done at newspaper headquarters, I can't remember the name of the town, uh, in Finland, but we had, I had fi forced my way into this space and uh, found these columns and I was like, okay. Uh, and this was a place, again, to start. We started with just the most fundamental idea of a column and developed those that eventually evolved into these biomorphic columns that began to animate and articulate uh, a space of the threshold uh, as you come into the park uh, and the columns are organized on light, so as light moves, they're not organized on a grid. They're organized on the passage of light. And so we're carving out of a refuse mound, a 20-foot high refuse mound, uh, and trying to repurpose that mound uh, as this sort of choreographed sequence into the park, elevated pathway, a reflecting pool on the roof, so you enter from the roof down into the grotto underneath. And uh, there, these columns morph uh, into these vessels of light. And of course, there's a plenum underneath the floor which provides air and allows it to stay at a constant 62 degrees year round. Uh, so it's very cave like. So, this is, uh, these are actually skylights at the top of the columns that then uh, light pours through the water, uh, through the column, and then begins to animate uh, the space. As you move through the columns, what's revealed on the other end is a kind of from vertical to horizontal space, a Mesian uh, kind of set up frame to the major lake in the park. Now, this didn't get built due to the recession, but there was another part of this. The, this is called the Experiential Center, called, uh, in fact, the Interpretive Center or the Ruth Lilly Visitors Pavilion, which we did have the opportunity to get built. Uh, and it, again, this is that, that site plan that you see uh, of the Experiential and the way it's tied together with the uh, pathway. But the, the site is in the oxbow of, a, of the White River here, downtown Indianapolis, Indianapolis Museum of Art Canal. So it's a peninsula. Uh, it has some real serious issues with flooding. It has three 100-year floods in the last eight years because of indiscriminate uh, uh, development upriver. Uh, and has turned the, effectively all of the land here, the 100 acres, into uh, a wetlands of some sort. So if you factor out flood wave, flood zones, all of that, all you have to build on is 0.67 acres in this park. So it was very easy to find our site. Um, and our site is wet, fecund, with water. We had to, the Corps of Engineers, you have to lift the building up five feet, which is right at eye level, out of the forest floor, working with our uh, uh, our uh, landscape architect, he came up with an idea of figured mounds that allowed the building to float above that and channel the water in and around it so that it almost seamlessly comes out of the forest floor and floats like an apparition uh, in the woods. But it's, our, our goal in any kind of systems project is to seek uh, the nirvana of one material, one detail in a project. Haven't done it yet, but we, we are always trying for it. Uh, and so, here we go, we're just using an exoskeleton, one material, uh, Ipe, uh, and that becomes the floor, the wall, and the canopy. It's like a, kind of like a taco uh, that's, or, or a tortilla that's wrap, wrapped around the program. But what we were inspired by was what we found in nature, the uh, microscopic images of butterflies, the leaves eaten away by insects, uh, uh, but yet having the structure left in place, a porous surface, not unlike the canopy of the trees, that would allow light, water, and air to pull through it. Same thing, what could a building, in an analogous way, do something similar? And so that's where it all came to fruition, and the exoskeleton that Guy designed here is, while it appears to be light, it's quite heavy, but you never see it. You only see it through its shadow cast by the sun, and it moves constantly. It pulsates with the rhythms of the day and the rhythms uh, of the season. Uh, it's different every day. It's imbued with the order of change. I need to get a video of this to show you how it just kind of comes on and off like a lantern. Uh, and, and then to get by the codes on the floor, on the deck, I should say, we inserted uh, one by two uh, ultra uh, or UV rated acrylic bars and screwed in the side uh, so you could, again, people could walk on it, but then we light it at night and it becomes this apparition in the woods. Uh, and it's very simple system, glass vitrine, uh, charred wood, service area, and then we begin to pleat uh, the system for larger holes, not just punch through it, but pleat the system itself. And this creates these 
other intensities of light uh, and, and chances for uh, snow and rain to pass through as well. And again, thinking about the abstraction, what weathers and what doesn't weather, this is now all silver, but the black charred box remains as abstract, uh, uh, it's sort of kind of an abstract permanence uh, in the woods. Small building, but first uh, National Honor Award winner for the city of Indianapolis in the entire history, but a beloved uh, building in the park. Now, using the systems, the idea of the unit and the multiple as a way to develop a system of articulation, less about form in many ways, and more about the space between, and more less about architecture of the thin, the fast, and the explicit. It challenges the Miesian uh, kind of paradigm for with an architecture that is thick, slow, and implicit. Uh, and so the idea of an interiority becomes manifest uh, in these types of projects rather than the uh, seamless interface between outside and inside. And so I just want to show you one student's project. It's a, a mosque in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And all of our projects begin by, you know, actually going there. Each student was given a cactus, an actual cactus that they observed, they measured, they analyzed, they tried to understand how water worked with it, how light, what makes it, uh, you know, stubbornly persistent uh, and bent on its own survival. What is that? And how, what is the analog for architecture. And very often I have uh, students look at natural elements, things that are not architecture but have an architecture in the way that maybe like a computer has an architecture. And to understand that as a system in an analogous way. And then we spend, each student spends 80 hours drawing a form surface uh, 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 drawing of the cactus itself and then developing a detail from the cactus focusing in, drawing that, as you can see in black and white, black and white, and that becomes the genesis uh, for uh, a field condition, a field of units uh, that is just basically uh, creating this fantasy of the cactus, right, a kind of, again, a transmutation. And from that, and I don't have, I wish I had all the process drawings, but through iteration after iteration, a tectonic wall is developed. And then the wall is tested against certain kind of formal uh, desires uh, in the way that it's situated by program and site to, to begin to discover the intelligence in the system, its ability to adapt to anomalies and eccentricities that may happen in the system. Uh, and we're also looking at materials, uh, things like uh, everything from uh, nickel, uh, to copper, to bronze, each student is given uh, metal. We work with A. Zaner uh, out of K Kansas City, and they use uh, chemical processes uh, and, and physical processes to begin to tr treat the metal, to begin to alter the metal, to understand what its own properties are uh, as they think about how they used it uh, for their particular uh, design. Always on the site, immersed in the site, speculating uh, in composite ways uh, of what it would be like to inhabit the site. Uh, and then beginning, we gave to give them, the pour, we pour plaster of Paris models that are blocks and they carve the project out of the block. So it is carved in its own way out of the darkness and the project emerges in a monolithic way, both landscape and architecture. And then, and only then, do we begin to speculate uh, uh, on the site plan and the students begin to develop a choreographed sequence uh, of vignettes that take you through uh, the land and to the interior uh, as well, and beginning to see what, test what this can do as a system of articulation in terms of experience. Simple plans, the plans tend to be simple, the sections not as much, especially on the envelope. And it really becomes a project that is very much about the envelope and the system itself, the exterior as well as the interior. Uh, and this is in great detail to understand the relationships between structure and cladding, how we build today, but beginning to conceive of it as something perhaps more monolithic, but done in layered ways. And then ultimately, this results uh, in the building and its position on the earth and to the sky, uh, the interior as well, because that's very important. And then, of course, uh, the ultimate uh, kind of uh, uh, articulation. In our own work, even at the smallest level, 
we're always dealing with systems. How do we deal with the unit and the multiple to develop uh, articulation, systems for articulation? A house, uh, a honey house for uh, a beekeeper in North Carolina, eight foot by 24 foot long. It's based on one architectural element, a wall made of quarter inch steel plate and folded glass that's load bearing. Essentially a load bearing wall made of voids. And this is developed through analyzing uh, the bee boxes of a beekeeper and understanding that the frames that you see in the bee box delimit the activity of the bee, but they don't change the way in which it's uh, programmed to behave. So it actually has its own system of operating within the frames. And so the idea of dual systems cooperating together to make a larger system is something we're, we're very, uh, very uh, keen on. And uh, a lot of this actually came out of sitting in a lecture by Jeff Kipnis years ago and talking about monads and self-generating systems. And then, you know, the whole time I've been drawing a bee house that looked like a bee. And it was only then that I certainly became to the realization that it's really about a system. It's about what does it do? What can it do rather than what does it look like? So analog versus metaphor. Uh, and so it becomes an organizing uh, wall for the display of honey, a brisole, as well as I said, a structural wall that carries half the load of this particular structure. And it ca comes with uh, opacity, translucency, transparency, depending on how you engage it. And it's conceived as a kit of parts, again, a system that is pre-manufactured in Fayetteville and then shipped to North Carolina, where this is at in Cashiers, North Carolina, and erected in three weeks. Why did we do that? Because it's hard to keep contractors in the mountains in North Carolina on the job, because they have all these seasons. They have like turkey season, deer season, you know, dating season, all of these things, and it's really, it's nuts. So we just said, well, we'll make it ourselves and ship it out there. And that's how, that's how it all worked out. So, but understanding this is what gives you, empowers you to scale up. If you can understand a system at this scale, you can understand it better at a larger scale. Now, shapes uh, are a big part of also what we're doing in the office. Uh, before I became an architect, I was a cartoonist. Uh, and I very much studied all my life how to get the greatest degree of expression from the most reduced diagram profile silhouette. I see every building as a visage, uh, as something having personality, something that uh, in, in effect uh, sits on the ground in a particular way, beats the sky in a particular way. And that is a special character that does not depend entirely on formal manipulations, but in, again on posture. So. Uh, shapes. So this is how we design, almost purely in section, uh, in silhouette. I'm working in a landscape that is mostly space, not a lot of form. Opposite of New York, which is mostly form, not as much space. So the singularity of, uh, of buildings is very important to me in the round. And understanding these on the horizon, the profile is everything. If you see a barn, you see a shed, you see a silo. Those are powerful in their relationship to the horizon. And that's how I often uh, see that. So we, this is a taxonomy. We have tons of these throughout the office. And again, looking at the everyday to find ways to represent the world in a different way. So perform a Gordon Matter clock here on this barn. We represent it uh, to become something else uh, through program, through site. Uh, through other external and internal forces in the process, and it becomes strangely familiar. And what it allows us to get away with is a, a, a lot of stuff in our neck of the woods here, because it, 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 is a, it produces a productive tension between what is local and what is global, being mindful of a more universal language, but bringing it into a local context uh, through uh, local form. And a, a project that sort of illustrates this very well is a, a post-Katrina project that uh, was funded by Oprah Winfrey and Autodesk, incredible collaboration there, uh, for Architecture for Humanity in Biloxi, Mississippi, starting with a shotgun house. FEMA has demanded that all buildings now be raised up to 11 feet above the street level in the city, all new buildings, which if you think about the social and urban implications of that, uh, is, is, it's, it's you know, again, transformational for city. 
Our approach was to simply recognize that there is an interface in our culture between the private world of the house and the public world of the street, which is the porch, the front porch. That's where people often socialize. So we insisted on keeping the porch on the ground as we elevated the, this building, 1,500 square foot house, and then we stacked the program to make it more adaptable to various sites and to minimize the residual space that you get from long shotgun houses, the local typology. And that became what we call the porch dog house, which is a prototypical market rate house for $135 a square foot uh, that can be reproduced, unlike many of the houses you see in the, get it, the I call it the get it right program, but the make it right program, uh, which are basically unicorns, half a million dollar homes, subsidized uh, to about $50,000, lead platinum, but who cares? Uh, in the end, you can't reproduce them. And, and that's, I think that's a big, Achilles heel of that program. Uh, but really dumb things, uh, perforated shutters that control the sun but also can be locked in place for security. A lot of people in Katrina died because they didn't want to leave their possessions. Here you can lock box the entire house. Uh, things like perforated stairs as water rises, doesn't force itself up into the house, it just comes through. Uh, and this, if you, the little uh, cottage you see there is a Katrina cottage by the new urbanist. This is the uh, demonstrates the impoverishment of their architectural ideas, not so much their urban planning principles, but architectural ideas. This is what they came up with. And I can guarantee you which building will be there in the next Category 4 storm. Uh, and I think in a Darwinian moment, we have to be able to adapt. Uh, and I think typologically, we have to see typologies as not fixed, but in fact, evolutionary and dynamic. So uh, the shape uh, student project I want to share with you is something that we've really uh, started to get into a little bit more, again, based on this idea that let's go with the thick, the slow, and the implicit. We have effectively outlawed what we call screens and things in the school temporarily. That means no perforated screens over a curtain wall system as a sectional device for the building. Some, uh, kind of faint stab at ephemerality, we're saying, no, let's try something else. Not that that is necessarily bad, but it becomes a trope in so many schools these days, uh, and it's, you know, it's easy at a certain level. So what, what if you had to actually make windows, you had to actually think about uh, figure uh, and, and, and the figural and figuration, what if all of that has to be taken on? You know, so decorated ducks and figural sheds come back on, onto the uh, menu. And so this particular case, we're doing a project in Dumbo at St. Anne's. It's a public bathhouse, which uh, New York has a whole history of, uh, and also a hidden speakeasy embedded in the bathhouse uh, that you wouldn't know you're in the uh, bathhouse if you're in the speakeasy, or you wouldn't know the speakeasy was there if you're in the bathhouse. Uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, centered around figure-figure relationships, following the light, and making concrete float. One material, one detail, concrete only. Uh, and again, as I said, situated uh, just across at the bottom of the Brooklyn Bridge here. Uh, the student, you know, is looking for sources of inspiration in the water chiladas uh, a project in the Canary Islands, uh, as well as things like Blade Runner. But just trying to think about atmosphere, uh, and to think about that, uh, the role of light in that. And again, it's located right in the courtyard of St. Anne's, uh, and it begins to kind of straddle that triangular courtyard, that wall, uh, the, the brick wall, which used to, uh, obviously used to be a storage building all along there. I think, uh, was it called Empire or Enterprise or something like that? It's that whole development along there. Um, and so we started by doing sections, no plans, sections only, charcoal and only and then once you got through charcoal and making of models and so forth you switch to the digital but shaping it thinking of the environmental and the thermal as a way to shape the interior and the and the interior and really starting to deal with thickness as a way to sort of begin to develop the plans that have a true figure ground relationship and as well developing a sectional and formal uh, figured uh, set of relations between outside and inside and then really thinking about how that manifests itself uh, sectionally in a, in a variety of volumes, uh, rather than just the extension of space you know, in one or two directions. 
and I think this becomes uh, uh, very, very critical to the complexity and richness of the space, and then a, a, a study of shapes and, and figures to get the right thing to work for you uh, as it situates itself between the sky and the ground. And, and then ultimately, this is the, uh, the building, which is all done in port and place concrete. Uh, and uh, we just worked with a concrete consultant. The students are working with, they're working with a lighting designer uh, here from New York. All of them are from New York. So we had people from Guy's office. Uh, we had Alex uh, Miller from Taylor Miller Lighting, uh, as well as uh, uh, Pratik Raval from Transolar, uh, working with the students on uh, chimneys and all sorts of things that deal with climate and comfort. And the students are, again, are working in drawing, casting concrete. I think that's something that should be dear to folks here at Cooper, this, cult, Cooper, this culture of making uh, styrofoam, burning the styrofoam to make the space out of the poor in place concrete, and then photographing it under light to begin to test uh, the vitality of those spaces. And then really trying to understand systems as well you think from geothermal to the, to the thermal variety that you would get in a public bath that has a, a caldarium and uh, a, 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 you know, the frigidarium and those different types of uh, cold and hot spaces. And then detailing it and really getting into the scale of the hand, how would something like this come together and what's possible? And again, just asking what is if, what if. Right, and so, Anyways, so this, these are the kind of shape. Now, shape is a big thing, and uh, it, probably none more so in this little project, which is a, an Orthodox Christian church uh, in Springdale, Arkansas. Uh, it's, a, it's a church that uh, was done for $100 a square foot. Uh, people ask, well, how did you do that? Well, first we went back to origins, just looking at what's the least we could do. And we went back to the beginnings of the church. Uh, and you know, looking at the typologies, looking at what's, what can we do to embed all the icons, all of the rituals that the church is involved with. This is where they used to uh, pray and worship in a rundown office building in Springdale. Uh, and they could say they only had $100 a square foot and they wanted us to build this church right here for them. And uh, we said, yeah, well, if we can make it out of cardboard, we would. Uh, we can do that for you. But, you know, but I said, we don't want to do this. Right here, these are adventures in religious architecture where I come from. And, you know, metal buildings with a cross hung on it. Now, I grew up uh, in the South, Southern Baptist, but, and you can debate this, but it's like, you know, I don't believe, if you believe in God, I don't believe he's hanging out there. Uh, you wouldn't live here. Uh, when your SUV costs more than the church, I think there's problems uh, with that, a value system problem. I, and I told them, I said, you don't want to go that route. And they said, well, yeah, but you, since you can't build us the big brick church with all the uh, traditions and Byzantine kind of influence that we wanted, uh, then you'll have to just work with this. And I said, oh, this is a welding shed on a piece of property they had bought near the interstate. And I said, oh, you mean like tear it down and then build a church, the sanctuary and the fellowship hall? And they were like, no, we want you to take this and turn it into the church. And of course, our hearts sank. And it was like, oh, man, this is, this is terrible. So any event, what we did is we added 10 foot to the front of it, produced a narthex that would set up a, an act, axial relationship with the uh, sanctuary, the fellowship hall with movable walls for overspill doing uh, special services. And we reskinned it with a box rib metal system off the shelf, but we fabricate all the transitional details uh, uh, locally. So you get a level of abstraction, you don't get what they give you. And so everything is coursed out, windows, doors, there's the fire door with the concrete pad at the bottom, everything is coursed. And so even if you can't afford it, the fidelity to craft and thought is paramount uh, to realizing something that's reductive and expressive. And that's what we were after here. And of course, and then we mixed in a little Corbusier with it because I, I feel like everything goes better with a little Corb uh, on the canopy here that we took from the, uh, uh, I believe it was the guardhouse from Gar uh, Garsh. Uh, and then we lit it up at night, like a, like a billboard. It faces the interstate. Uh, this is the site here, uh, looking to the interstate. And there's other big red patches or big mega churches in the area. Here you go. Most of our projects come with cows. This is the section through the narthex. You have the uh, Father John's office on the second floor, looking down the narthex. Uh, that uh, cabinet here, 
uh, right here is a return air duct. This is the niche for St. Nicholas, the patron saint. You pick up candles here and you go underneath the tower, bathe in the blood of Christ, and then into the uh, sanctuary. Uh, and, and so there that is. And it's just a, a kind of very simple ritual that's uh, done uh, every time there is a worship service. Again, bathe through the tower, the top, and the, and the blood red. And then inside, we cut one, one hole uh, in the uh, existing building to get eastern light. Uh, and then an iconostasis made of uh, bar stock steel. Uh, again, everything, though, is proportioned with Greek proportioning system. So we're using the golden mean as a way to polish uh, the form and the spaces to get that kind of connectivity, not only to their history of the church, but also between the different scales of the building. One of the things that they had to have, though, was a dome and with a pantocrator. And there was no way we could put a dome on top of the building because of uh, the superstructure having to cut through it. So uh, we spec a fiberglass dome. They couldn't afford it. The contractor didn't think he could build one well enough. And they were stuck in the middle of construction with no dome. And they were very upset. And finally, the contractor came up with an idea. He said, you know, I know a guy 20 miles out in the mountains. Uh, he's a metal worker, and he loves beer. So for two cases of beer, uh, we can get a satellite dish, and that can become our dome. And so that's what we did. We gave two cases of beer. We got the, uh, the, the dish. We, we brought it back in. We skim coated it in plaster, jacked it up on a scissor lift, and here we are. We, they have their dome. And so that's how we roll in, in Arkansas. And uh, the beauty of this is uh, that in 2013, we got a phone call from the National uh, uh, AIA to tell us that this had won a National Honor Award. And they were so impressed with the budget, they said they did some research on this and discovered that this is the least expensive building ever to win a national AIA honor award. And so what it does is underscores what we're doing out in the middle of the country, which is to demonstrate that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, at any budget, and for anyone. Uh, and that's something that's, I think, uh, very important to what we're doing and what we're trying to work with on the students. But increasingly, the land where I am, which is rural, is becoming more and more suburbanized. And this condition you see here, where these two conditions are rubbing up against each other, is, is quite powerful. We were asked by a, a pediatrician to design a clinic for him right in the middle of a suburban, huge suburban development in Rogers, Arkansas. And again, I've talked about trying to be inclusive. So it wasn't a matter of ignoring that it was there. It was the way of questioning it, critiquing it, and saying, could we, what if we could develop a new species of suburban architecture uh, through a process of uh, abstraction? What if we could take one material, two colors, one form, and challenge all the ersatz, uh, exaggerated, uh, 12 different materials, 12 different moves on every building you see in suburbia? And so what we came up with was uh, this particular figure, this pedi pediatric clinic uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in suburbia. And it is, uh, there are no windows on the south side because due to HIPAA, they can't have windows in the patient room. So everything is skylit from above. But it creates a figure that's analogous to what's going on. Port Cashier, patients dropped off. Uh, the foot, which is the stair that brings you to the reception area. These are all the patient rooms. The staff have their own entrance back here. And this is a lounge for doctors in between their calls, surgery and so forth, uh, what places where they relax. So it's a place for the worker as well as for the patient. And this is the context it sits in. Uh, we like to call it an abstract figure in a landscape of unholy unions. And so we're looking at the things we love, billboards, uh, silos, grain elevators, and, and then also those things that we're we don't love so much the typical suburban. Well, what if we got those together in an unholy union, and that's what manifests itself uh, in, the, uh, in the, the pediatric clinic, which understands its place in suburbia, not just to be engaged by the foot traffic, but by cars. And so as you drive by at 40 miles an hour, engage the custom cayenne red box red metal skin uh, and pass it, it begins to act as more of a sign or billboard in the landscape uh, than uh, something completely in the round and begins to flatten out. So here's the Port Cashier uh, into the lobby. We covered all of the, uh, 
the main stair in blue glass up above, so you get this ephemeral light of blue that changes throughout the day, that creates a sense of wonder for the kids and parents to go up through. Uh, very uh, carefully laid out, efficiently laid out uh, between the patient and the staff so you don't get a lot of chaos and overlap uh, in, in their circulation and flow. And very quiet and zen-like in the, in, the, uh, in the waiting room, which if you have kids and you've ever been to a pediatric clinic, it is very often chaos. And so we really are letting the architecture dictate the behavior or, how, or model the behavior, perhaps, of how you occupy this particular space. Uh, and then, again, the uh, figure up above, this is the lounge with the north light for the doctors and their staff, uh, light it up at night, and add a little art. But again, it challenges in its own way uh, the status quo. And I think key to the idea of practice, once you leave the academy or once you leave the school, is to offer alternative models in everything that you do. This is what can change the benchmark for reality for all the people here, because I think we the people don't necessarily love architecture, because they, their reality is a certain way. But if you can begin to alter that reality, you might get a kind of engagement that you never might have imagined. So we're now working on a school, an independent school in Bentonville, Arkansas. It's called the Thaden School. This is a school uh, that is about pl applied learning, 6 through 12. It's a maker school. They have three signature programs. Uh, it's called uh, basically Wheels, Meals, and Reels. Each student gets a bicycle. They learn how to fabricate bikes. Uh, they learn bike culture. Uh, they learn how to fix bikes. Uh, they also have uh, meals. They learn how to produce food, to grow food, uh, to cultivate food, to make food. And Reels, they learn how to tell stories using animation and film. These are the three programs. Uh, and so we wanted to make a campus from scratch. Uh, this is working with landscape architect Andrew Pogon, as well as uh, Eskew Dumez Ripple. We divided up some of the buildings. Uh, but a school for scrap, a 30-acre campus, they had taken the dean of students from Princeton and made them the headmaster for this school. And so the curriculum and the school become a didactic kind of relationship. Uh, and we started just by looking at our place, at farm groupings that we have. We, the leading producer of chickens in the country, uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, but we looked at that as a way to begin to start thinking about how we lay uh, this campus out. And there's a, a west campus and an east campus uh, right here, uh, a big covered drop-off. Uh, this is uh, all the arts uh, and what, what we call reels, the animation and classrooms here. This is uh, wheels with a bike fabrication maker labs, the home building for uh, dining and for the cultivation and making of food, testing kitchens, and then the performing arts center here, and then the bike barn with its pump track and soccer and all of that. So, and it's named after a, a, a pilot, Louise Thaden, who was a contemporary of Amelia Earhart, who grew up in Bentonville, Arkansas. So that was very important as well. And so we developed this 300 foot long, 20 foot wide, uh, what we call the super shed, using an uh, operation called pitch and roll, which is the same operation used to fly a plane, uh, begin to develop kind of formal relationships there, but also by perforating the mill-finished aluminum and uh, with uh, poly, uh, poly gal on the, on the roof of this thing, we create a kind of constant changing dappled light that is analogous to the bosque of pecan trees that sit right next to it. Again, every aspect of this, of the buildings and campus becomes an educational opportunity. And again, we're inspired, again, not just by nature made, but by machine made. So we were really uh, interested in how we could make building that would work with the grasses that were being planted, as well as the uh, green gold uh, paint uh, with a Shelby GT, uh, Mustang Shelby GT 67, this one is. And so we developed a custom color, green gold with gold metal flake. Uh, and, and something that changes in the light, uh, again, to be an, uh, uh, how would you say, an interface between uh, the grasses uh, and, again, this idea of the machine. Uh, and then this, uh, this becomes that figure that moves through the landscape here. And this is the Reels building. It's just been completed and occupied. Uh, it will also be the place for uh, film, the local film festival, 
Uh, it'll be one of the venues for that because that's where films are being made at this school. So this is a community lawn, people to watch films on. Uh, and uh, you can begin to see it too, its roof now also pitches and roll. It's a 600 foot long building and rather than being just a straight shed like the chicken sheds, we begin to inflect it to scale the uh, length of it, but begin to pitch and roll the roof to scale each room. So rather than just dealing with some notion of equality, which is the same, we want to deal with equity. Uh, this is uh, very different, right? If you see a race, you have staggered lanes when you're going around a curve rather than the same line because everybody starts from a different place. And so it isn't just the numbing instrumentality that you often find in school where everybody gets the same room, but in fact, you get variety of light, of space uh, uh, throughout the building, and that creates the delight. These are skylights that, you know, light the outside, and what's that about? You know, it, well, it's about always being connected to the sky, to the ground, uh, and so forth. Uh, inside, we had very little money, but plywood, is a big datum here, so we use plywood roofs. We're building this for $218 a square foot. Uh, this is the student lounge here that you see on the end, faces west, so we wanna kinda think about how the sun works on that where the brie soleil. And then we just started the plantings as well, night. And this is the, the wheels building. It interfaces with Main Street, so it has a big bike shed uh, they, the students will, as part of their community service, will fix neighborhood uh, bikes, the community's bikes, for free on Saturdays. So it has this big covered, perforated uh, uh, visor that also blocks the western sun. So again, try to do two or three things with one thing. And uh, we, the, the barn that I want to talk about here is uh, a, a reinterpretation of the Ozark Red Barn uh, that uh, begins, again, is developed in profile, built like a barn, air blows through it, it's off the grid, except for the changing rooms, and it all made locally with local uh, uh, prefabricated trusses, wood trusses, uh, and it lights up like a lantern at night, and this really becomes the hood ornament uh, for the school, no pun intended, and it's under construction now. And then the final building that's coming together is the Performance uh, Center. And, and then again, this is a, a building that's kind of negotiating between the uh, other three buildings. Uh, I would spend a, a good bit of time at the American Academy this year uh, and designed the building there with our consultant from London, a, a theater consultant. And this idea of the loggia in a small town that would organize the edge uh, of the street and provide a place for activity and shelter uh, and some semblance of urbanity. Uh, and rather than uh, on a corner site, if I can I'll pull that back just a little bit, a lot of people say, oh, you've got to reinforce the corner. But it's really not urban, as you can see. This is the town. And so this is a uh, public park the school had made for people to walk their dogs and stuff. So we just fold that in. And what we really strengthen is the entry into the campus this way, uh, moving east-west. And this armature then really begins to establish an edge and sets up space at the corner rather than form. So it's an inversion of how you might typically approach it, but we're not in a typical situation here. And then we're using the same boxer of metal system uh, to begin to uh, develop, uh, again, some delight there. Uh, this is the big porch. There's no lobby here to the performance center, but people can come out of the, the main stair and performances can happen out here as well. Uh, the inside, is very simple, straightforward. And then the section through the theater, about it's 300 uh, seat, it can span to 700 because it's, uh, the stage is level with the ground and you can lift some of the front seating up to kind of flatten out the stage and put more people there. And all made out of local red oak, plywood, quarter sawn to reveal the grain in that. So this is in design development and uh, we'll be start construction at the first of the year. And that should complete the whole school. But again, very much about shape. Very much in the way, same way as the new park we just finished a few years ago with James Corner Field Operations. I'm sure everybody knows who they are with the High Line. We worked for several years with them on the largest urban park in America, 4,500 acre urban park in Memphis, Tennessee. 
Uh, this is uh, the river, Mississippi River. Memphis is along, the connection between Arkansas and Tennessee. Uh, of course, the birthplace of rock and roll. Uh, Jerry, Lewis, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, uh, Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, all of those folks played on this street, Beale Street. Uh, in the 50s, it was really a hub for that. But at the same time, on the opposite side of Memphis was a prison farm where uh, prisoners worked the 4,500 acres uh, of uh, crops, vegetables, uh, cattle, and cotton to feed themselves, but also to sell that to the local community. Uh, in the 70s, that became a kind of not a, a, a acceptable form of rehabilitation. That land was given to the county. Uh, the county didn't know what to do with 4,500 acres. A nonprofit emerged, and Shelby Farms Park emerged with it. A park that was uh, actually quite uh, uh, popular, but did not reflect the socioeconomic diversity of Memphis and wasn't used as much and was having difficulty sustaining itself. It's quite large. I just want to illustrate to you Shelby Farms. This is Central Park right here. So Shelby is as big as downtown uh, Memphis here. So it's, it's quite a park. So uh, JCFO uh, worked with a, a master plan to plant a million trees, to rethink all the different landscapes. But the key component was a 200-acre heart of the park that needed to expand a lake and create a series of programs and structures that could create their own economic viability and sustain the park. Uh, this was like a, a, a stage kiosk, visitor center, restaurant retreat center, uh, event center, uh, picnic pavilions, uh, boat kiosks, things like that. And that was what we were asked to do. So, and or, or work with JCFO to organize those around uh, this expanded lake. And so we came to see those as a series of figures, an ensemble uh, that are in dialogue with each other with a reduced palette of materials and one central operation, which is shade. How can each building create its own shade? Because where we're at, without shade, there are no people. It's a very hot and humid place. Uh, so that was, that was our goal. And this is that figure of characters that fill out the, uh, the deal. And then, of course, uh, we start again with typologies, with going back to origins, the dog trot house, how do you create breezes, uh, porches, what, what do they do? How do we bring that forward? This is an 8,000 square foot visitor center with an 8,000 square foot porch. Uh, the boat kiosk with its own figure with the uh, canoes. Uh, uh, in storage and, and kayaks, picnic pavilions that are reserved out for three months, they're called the crickets, and the stage pavilion, which also has to act as a shade pavilion when it's not being used. And then the restaurant retreat center, this is the kind of the landscape we're working in, restaurant retreat center that uh, effectively is really about uh, uh, events, but the restaurant itself is really about a porch as well. It's an 80-foot deep porch that has more seating outside than inside, facing the western sun. You get these beautiful sunsets uh, on the lake. So all of these are driven by shape. It's, a, it's basically uh, a shape vocabulary that ties them together as well as material. Local cypress, uh, zinc-like uh, metal, and then bar grate. And that's something that we used for the visitor center, which is the, really the, the nerve center of the entire park that also deals in shape, but also in an articulation system made of found materials that we created our own uh, uh, cladding system with. And so that leads us to the final part of this, hybrids, where they both come together. And I think if you think about what I'm showing you, they're always already there. It's just there's different emphases. But here we're more mindful of the combination uh, of the idea of systems and shapes to make uh, a more robust architecture. And so, again, this is a 32-foot cantilever, provides shade year-round, and it's cooled by five 20-foot big-ass fans, that, uh, and that's the product name for them. But that, that is important because you can program the porch year-round where it creates its own, again, revenue stream for the park and its own breezeways that create the transition from parking to the landscape, but also create its own breezes to help cool. Uh, so again, one or two ma uh, materials moving through and then into an unobstructed view of the landscape through this enlarged Canley. Where again, we work with Guy Nordenson and ECI on this. And uh, this uh, 
bar grate, aluminum bar grate is light. You have to come up with a connection to tie it to the, to the substructure, then to the superstructure. But it creates a diaphanous uh, kind of quality to the vertical surface uh, that can be lit from within and begin almost lantern-like, jellyfish-like uh, as the sun sets. Another project that takes on these similar characteristics of systems and shape is the, the kind of uh, Keenan Tower House, which is really pivotal in our uh, careers. This really kind of what set us up nationally, which is a seven-story house in, uh, in Fayetteville. And we had never done a tower before, but I had seen towers, the local grain elevators. I had traveled to Italy. I'd been to Yemen. And uh, we were really inspired by how towers are organized, kind of in reverse, where the, the biggest social spaces are at the very top rather than at the bottom. But we had to look at what nature had given us on the site, which was these beautiful oak trees and the striated bark. And so we looked at those and developed our own analogous kind of system uh, of milled white oak fins that wrap a 50-foot high stairway and create a kind of filtered light uh, into this vertical space. And you can see we're using local creek stone, uh, uh, local uh, river rock, and crushed pecan shells for the floor. So you actually sink in the floor when you step on it. And these are our, our very fit clients you see going up the steps. There's actually 99 steps. Couldn't get it into 100. But once you get to the top, this is a, a place of, uh, with uh, views in 360 all the way around. Uh, it was, so it's really more about the horizon. A stair falls out of the ceiling, you climb up, and then it's a room with control spaces to the outside, but th there is no roof. So it's really about the sky above. So the whole structure becomes a structure about view and the act of viewing. Uh, as much as is as a place of dwelling. And a lot of this had come from developing our own vocabulary early on when we had no work. Uh, so I developed a series of prototypes, houses. Uh, one in particular was the Dragonfly House, which came from a, a, a form of architectural husbandry of taking a dragonfly and a camper and selectively uh, marrying them together uh, to, to create this particular figure. Uh, we never got a commission to do this, but when we got the tower, we thought, well, here's an opportunity uh, to kind of repurpose that as well. So, and it, it really uh, it made a lot of sense in relationship to the wood and to that uh, beautiful metal skin that relates to a series of towers in the landscape uh, as well. So this last project I want to show you, the last uh, uh, student project, uh, was just recently done a couple of years ago at UT Austin, where we wanted to rethink the typology of the monastery and uh, my favorite building in the world is La Tourette. Uh, the students had been to La Tourette, so we had gotten drawings of it. Uh, and uh, we wanted to do a vertical monastery. That was the project in Memphis on the banks of the Mississippi, based on the writings of Thomas Merton, uh, a kind of new monasticism that is no longer about just introspection, living in the world, in a, uh, a place shut off from the world, but it's about civic engagement as well. So it's both interior and exterior in terms of that engagement. What would that be like? Uh, so the students had to analyze uh, Corbusier's La Tourette, and I asked them to kind of look at the relationships historically and kind of internally, and then repurpose it on a vertical site, on a site less than half the size of the site of La Tourette. And so they had to take those elements and refigure them, restack them without changing them. Uh, and this began to evolve into a kind of new configuration uh, of an existing typology and work, uh, canonical work. And then I asked each of them to 3D print those, all right, so we could see them uh, as the way you see La Tourette as something that's both sculptural and spatial. And so we create a kind of new type. And that was what we're after. And that was the setup uh, to begin to develop in this particular case, this monastery that employs systems and shapes and figure along the Mississippi uh, in uh, South Memphis uh, next to a park, the DeSoto Park, where DeSoto first discovered uh, the Mississippi. Uh, and going through a series of programmatic uh, iterations and diagrams to look uh, at the different permutations that stacking a vertical system uh, would imply uh, to ultimately then 
begin to think about it three-dimensionally in an iterative way. So this is one student going through a series of permutations uh, to finally arrive at, uh, at the figure that most satisfied the site, the program, uh, and the architectural desire. And then finding ways to represent that in, in both by, in some ways, by deconstructing it, but also by reconnecting it. In this case, uh, the most sacred part is at the top of an Indian mound, which is in the DeSoto Park, and finding that relationship out to the river uh, beyond. And then to really starting to develop those relationships uh, sectionally. So it really becomes not so much a plan problem, but a sectional problem. Uh, and, and then looking at that interstitial condition uh, between the different uh, primary programmatic spaces. And then looking at the interface with the park and with the river as a way to shape uh, the building itself, again through uh, one material, in this particular case, uh, zinc-clad concrete. And then you begin to see on both sides but between the, the banks of the river and the park itself. Final models, interiors, and then the building. So here it all comes together in a kind of resolute way where all of the scales, scale of the city, the scale of the building, are, and the scale of the hand are in dialogue with each other. And this last project I'll show you is something we had the opportunity to do, which is an architecture school for the University of Arkansas. Uh, uh, enormous challenge, it was the first major scale project for our office. We teamed with Polk Stanley Wilcox out of Little Rock uh, to build up a little bit more capacity. And we had the opportunity to add 35,000 square foot to a 65,000 square foot Beaux-Arts building. Uh, we were informed by the school that, that all the new addition had to do is be the same width and length as this neoclassical eastern wing. Uh, many people on our faculty and at the university said, well, you should just take this and repeat it over here. And I said, well, yeah, but we're not Notre Dame. Uh, we wouldn't do that. Uh, and that would be anathema to a 21st century school of architecture. So we did want to be responsive to how we work both with the terrain and with the typology and what existed. So we used a, a very controlled uh, series of materials, uh, limestone rain screen panels that come nearby from the original quarry for the limestone on the old building, a 200 foot long uh, custom made uh, brisolet of fritted glass fins and steel uh, framed glass and poured in place concrete uh, by the fellow who did the concrete for Tedeo Ando's Pulitzer Museum, uh, Peter Clarkson, who wrote our specs for that. And those were the three materials primarily. And then we used the proportioning system, very similar to the existing, to create a dialogue uh, between the old and the new. Again, this condition of resonance, is, which is what we were after. And then figuring out how to actually build it on a very constrained site, which was deprogramming the, the middle, which was filled with books, because this used to be a library, uh, and then reprogram it. Uh, so we build our way, we put a crane in the middle and build our, our way out and then add the addition. Uh, and then this is the figure, uh, kind of a sectional figure uh, that creates an interface between the community of the university uh, and what's going on inside with the studios and the auditorium and such. Uh, Full-scale mock-ups, uh, again, this is all custom designed uh, and locally made, uh, and that becomes our one window. That was our big joke. We're making just one window and one figure. Uh, and a new entrance that then allows the rest of the university to move through the building along the axis, the main axis of the university. Uh, and then repurposing, again, taking down 200-year-old oak trees, turning them into tableaus, creating them into lumber, uh, and then they, this tableau becomes a stage. We've had Shakespearean actors, mariachi bands, uh, exhibits, the whole thing. Uh, and then a diagram that shows what's renovated, what's restored, what's new. And how does all that come together as a system so that perceptually you create an interiority uh, that seems almost seamless. You understand the relationships, but it's not about uh, dissonance uh, between the old and new. And then the most difficult space was the, our big, uh, uh, a big our, our great hall, so to speak, uh, where we do our reviews and such, which was the reference part of the library. Poor light, poor acoustics. We blew the top off of it, reprogrammed it with studios, stretched the 2,500 square foot fabric, perforated fabric, backlit it. The perforations help with the acoustics, cut a hole in the middle of it, 
eight foot by 20 foot piece of glass from Germany. That becomes the window to the sky uh, in the middle. And then we cut a hole in the west wall to allow you to take things out of the room, which were landlocked, uh, and make that threshold uh, from the old to the new. So really, the DNA of the old and the DNA of the new become mixed here and create something else. And both are better for it, I think. So here's some of those uh, uh, images there. And then the formal joint between the old and new, which is actually programmed stairs, transparency, as well as social spaces. And, and then some primary spaces, big auditorium. Underneath the rake becomes the student lounge. And then behind the screen becomes the faculty lounge. So all of that is kind of programmed together and becomes uh, a great classroom with natural light or not. And then uh, on the top are faculty offices, a green roof, very monk-like uh, 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 office spaces uh, with seminar rooms, an outdoor porch, place to take lunch, also a place for uh, education classroom uh, as well, and a place of refuge and prospect looking out to the Boston Mountains to the south. And then ultimately, you see the multi-generations with the oldest building on campus in the far distance, Old Main, that middle generation and the new generation all uh, in dialogue with each other. Uh, I've had to talk fast, uh, which is hard for a Southerner, uh, but I, I thank you and I, and I welcome your questions. Thanks.